Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Romali here with the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for June 24th, 2021, recorded on 2.12 p.m. Eastern Time. We have a lot to talk about today, including the potential for a tropical storm to be forming in the Atlantic Basin and the potential for a hurricane to be impacting Mexico over the next couple of days. So let's go ahead and jump straight into everything. Taking a wide look across the tropical Atlantic this afternoon, we have Invest Area 95E, which is located here in the Eastern Pacific Basin. And this will be getting awfully close here to the coast of Mexico over the next couple of days. And this could bring impacts uh, even as far north as potentially the Cabo San Lucas Resort areas and the Baja Peninsula. And maybe some of that moisture gets funneled all the way up into Arizona and starts the monsoon season there. Um, but this will bring uh, heavy rainfall, gusty conditions, squally conditions there to parts of Mexico. And uh, obviously it's going to be, you know, a problem could cause some mudslides, gusty winds, heavy rainfall, uh, you know, flash flooding. That's always a concern. We'll take a look at that here in the modeling in just a moment. And then in the Atlantic Basin, we have a dying tropical wave, which is now degenerated into an open wave. Uh, but this will bring in a form of shower and thunderstorm activity to the Lesser Antilles and Barbados. So for you folks there here in the Lesser Antilles and Barbados, of course, it's just something to kind of keep an eye on. Keep an eye to the sky, but nothing uh, in, in the form of a tropical depression or storm. Uh, but this will bring impacts, you know, sensible weather, dusty winds, heavy rainfall, the potential for some flash flooding issues there uh, in poor drainage locations. So that's going to be a problem. And then we have a new tropical wave designated Invest Area 95L in the eastern Atlantic here. This is now just coming off the coast of Africa, way down here at the very low latitudes. And this will be traversing towards the west-northwest over the next couple of days in a rather uh, warm area here and rather untapped area. But we noticed that just to the north, we have a bout of unfavorable weather out here, including dry Saharan air and cooler sea surface temperatures compared to the long-term average. And this is certainly going to cause some problems as we have a very complicated setup that's going to happen, very fragile setup. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So looking at the development area for 95E, again, we can see that development chances now up to 90% uh, in the five-day period. And in the two-day period, we're down to, we're up to about 80% at this point. And you can see that, again, this could bring some impacts here to coastal Mexico as this kind of just sits here and meanders around in this area or potentially gets pulled northward towards coastal Mexico. Uh, whatever is likely to come out of this, though, this will be close enough that again, most of our systems so far have developed down here across this area in the equatorial Pacific. And uh, this now is developing closer to land and thus could bring uh, some impacts now to coastal Mexico. So if you have family or friends, you know, relatives down there, just let them know that, hey, you know, something could be heading your way within, you know, a couple of days time frame. And to kind of corroborate that, this is the GFS 850 millibar vorticity. It's been in the atmosphere about 5,000 feet off the ground. And just for context here, again, the darker reds here, this is the higher cyclonic spin indicating a more organized area of low pressure and cyclonic wind flow. Uh, now, what's interesting is, again, our system is very vague right now, very broadly defined. If we look here at the visible satellite imagery, uh, we can actually see that, again, it's a very vague system. Maybe some indications here that we are starting to get a closed low-level center of circulation, maybe seeing some westernlies here, and you certainly got those easternlies here. So we could be looking at a low-level center trying to close off here uh, in this particular area. And if it does so uh, within the next couple of days, again, you know, before conditions start to become a little bit less favorable, this will likely become a tropical storm or hurricane. And some of the modeling does depict that, again, this gets awfully close. You can already see that we're starting to get some of these banding features here on the eastern side uh, as this kind of rotates around. And because of that, there's already going to be impacts here to parts of coastal Mexico in the form of heavy rainfall and flooding. You get any of these training bands to set up over a multitude of time. You can also drive maybe a little bit of storm surge uh, over maybe just, you know, a little less than a foot of storm surge. But that's still going to be a problem for extreme coastal areas here in Mexico and of course, with any orographic lift over here in the uh, higher elevations, you could easily squeak out heavier rainfall in the or in the uh, due to orographic lift, and that could cause a very substantial problem 
uh, as uh, the heavy rainfall bands set up across this area. And again, on the GFS forecast, this ends up developing here, but notice that we have a setup that is very complicated because we have two systems here that are kind of working on each other, and this becomes the dominant system. But because these are in somewhat of close proximity, they are sort of influencing each other uh, with the intertropical convergence zone as well. You can kind of see this area of uh, kind of background cyclonic winds in, in here. And that this is kind of indicating, if we look here at the net flow uh, on the GFS, what we'll kind of notice is that we have southeasterly winds here at the surface, and then up aloft, they kind of turn towards more of a northwesterly component. So you have kind of southeast and then turning to northwest and eventually kind of uh, northwest here uh, by about, uh, you know, 200 millibars thereafter. Now, uh, we don't really have a factor of wind shear. We can tell that wind shear is not going to be a big problem here, but there is the background steering flow that is relatively weak. We don't really have a component of strong uh, steering patterns at this point, which means that, again, if we get a stronger storm that develops in here, we will get what's known as a beta drift. And beta drift is basically a strong vortex is more likely to be pulled further towards the north. And we talk about this all the time in the Atlantic Basin with how storms could be impacted by this and whether or not our cat, it catches a trough, etc. In this case, because we don't really have a trough over this region, we're not going to get a system that just gets picked up and shoved inland. But because of beta drift, this will naturally want to ride further northward than if we had a weaker system that would likely get tugged further on out to sea at this point. Now, after this time, though, we have this upper level disturbance that's kind of getting sheared apart uh, from ridging further towards the north. And what this is likely to do here is this will likely end up influencing our system. We kind of notice that, again, if we jump uh, out here to uh, the 500 millibar vorticity, Again, what we'll notice is that we have kind of this broad area here of flow aloft, and this is a trough that's digging in down across here. Now, because we have a trough that's digging, digging in across this region, this will likely, uh, this larger cyclonic flow in here is likely going to kind of stand still and try to move a little bit more north. Again, this trough here, it's weakening. It's not a very deep trough, but it's going to try to turn the system further northward and you can kind of see the reflection in that uh, with the GFS forecast here as this upper level disturbance now begins to kind of uh, cut away and back towards the southwest. We get the influence. Steering motions generally uh, favor closer to Mexico. And this is where we could have a land concern where it gets awfully close and then kind of steers away uh, as uh, wind shear now becomes a bigger problem. And then we may even have something trying to develop there in the Atlantic Basin. But uh, this is going to be a problem for coastal Mexico either way in terms of heavy rainfall and flooding. So if you have any family, friends down there, just let them know that something could be on the horizon there. And make sure to pay attention to local media and local weather service offices for the most up-to-date information there. In the Atlantic Basin, we have Invest Area 95L, which was designated as of last night. And because of this, or designated this morning, I believe, rather. But because of this, we now have, I believe, the furthest east invest of the entire record books, as in the earliest furthest east uh, invest so far. And this is very far south. This is the equator down here. All right, so this is zero degrees right there. This is sitting at about you know, five degrees north. Now, this is a very big area. And if we kind of go to the zoomed out look at everything, we'll take a look at this. And we can see that indeed this area is much, much broader than just a very small area. Now, our localized area of low pressure is sitting roughly about in this area. And we can tell that again, we have some of these convergences here and we have a lot of westerly winds that are feeding into this. And what this is a result of is uh, we have an, an ongoing westerly wind uh, burst in the Atlantic Basin. And especially at low latitudes, we have this westerly wind component that's being fed into the system. And about 5,000 feet off the ground at the 850 millibar uh, area, we have this African easterly jet that is pushing winds to the east. And whenever you kind of get this opposing flow, this slower flow over faster flow, we talk about this with wind shear in... Um, you know, severe weather setups for tornadoes, we get this background horizontal vorticity. 
And that's what's being created down here is horizontal rotation that because these thunderstorms are going up down here, you kind of translate that into vertical vorticity. And this is just background of the pressure perturbations in the atmosphere. So this is likely trying to develop some area of surface convergence. And we'll have to watch for whether we get an area of low pressure to develop here or whether this other wave to the north that's coming off of Africa ends up influencing this and ends up kicking whatever this is northward. And some of the modeling has suggested that because this gets ejected northward, we end up losing a lot of the development chances. And that's hence one of the reasons why, uh, if you've seen some of the models, that they've dropped development entirely and the National Hurricane Center hasn't really raised chances all that much because it's very uncertain. And because of this, again, you start getting north of 10 degrees north latitude here, you'll notice that we have a lot of dry and stable air north of here. And development chances after this point, if it gets beyond 10 degrees north latitude, forget about it. It's going to be gone. And you're not going to have development chances. But if this can stay anywhere between 5 to maybe 9 degrees north and kind of ride this area and move westward, this may actually have a shot at development before sea surface temperatures and dry air and more stability uh, in that region causes problems. Now, upper ocean heat content wise for this environment, we're sitting with the disturbance right now at about five degrees north, which is roughly here. And in this belt here, we have a fairly strong area of upper ocean heat content. And again, what this basically measures is the warm water depth. And basically the warmer the colors get anywhere from these lighter blue colors onwards towards the right of the scale, Tropical cyclones love to upwell cooler water. If you have a lot of upper ocean heat content, which is what the right side of the scale represents, the warmer colors, you basically only upwell warmer water. You don't really create a downwelling or you don't really create an upwelling effect. You just continue to feed uh, the system with warm water and, and uh, unstable air. And right now we have a fairly decent amount of upper ocean heat content. But what you'll notice is that if you get any more than about 10 degrees north, you start to really lose a lot of this upper ocean heat content until you get uh, past really about 55 degrees west. You really start to lose that anywhere to the east of here. Now, west of here, you start to pick up a more favorable western Atlantic. And this is where, again, tropical waves have theoretically, in a theoretical sense, a better shot at developing due to the warm sea surface temperatures and higher heat content through here. But uh, the wind shear is the biggest lacking problem right now uh, in the tropical Caribbean. And that's what's likely to kind of keep this down if it does, in fact, go through that area. Now, if we look here at the 850 vorticity map, again, spinning the atmosphere 5,000 feet off the ground. Uh, and, and in this context here, the reds and whites, this is the higher cyclonic spin at your 5,000 foot level. Here's invest area 95E over here. We talked about that. Uh, so our main focus now is off here, and you can just kind of see off the area, off the screen here, we kind of have these two lobes of vorticity, and this is the southernmost one that is now being designated as an invest, and this is the one that's coming way off there towards the north, about 10 degrees north, uh, but this is going to be the one that we're going to be watching. It's so far to the east that this map actually doesn't get a better look at it, so unfortunately that's a problem, but... We do have an earlier scatterometer pass, and shame on me for not pulling it up, but uh, that did suggest a very sharp trough axis in here with uh, winds that uh, were coming out of the west here and coming up to the east at a higher latitude here. And this maybe suggests that we are starting to get more of that background cyclonic vorticity to kind of shape up, but whether or not something actually develops out of this is going to be the main primary driving factor at this point. Now, one thing that this system will be getting a boost from is this convectively coupled Kelvin wave. This active uh, wave here is passing over the Atlantic Basin. And all these blues here, this is basically rising air in the atmosphere uh, and associated uh, largely with reduced vertical wind shear. And we are having an active phase pass over not only the Atlantic, but also the Eastern Pacific Basin, potentially aiding in 90, 95E's development. Uh, but this active phase of the Kelvin wave is passing over, and it usually takes about one to two days uh, for any systems to actually, for the atmosphere really, to kind of feel the, the kick of this wave. And we don't really have a suppressed phase kind of in between here, like we saw with uh, 94L that was down here getting a kick from a active Kelvin wave. 
but because we don't have this suppressed phase, it's kind of neutral, uh, we're likely to kind of see upward moving air continue across this region for quite some time. And because we're going to have another active phase pass through the region shortly thereafter, it does seem like that uh, this will kind of kickstart uh, the African easterly waves uh, further and may be able to enhance 95L uh, even more so. And because of that, so here's the ship's version uh, of the 95L forecast. Again, this is basically the diagnostic, or this is really the, the statistical slash diagnostic runs here. This is the 12Z run. Now, again, I'm not really focused here more so on the you know wind speeds. Yes, this does have a storm that ends up developing, but what's important to notice is that shear right now, while it's light, will begin to increase. And within about 36 hours, shear becomes a little bit too strong for tropical cyclone genesis. And if we look here at, uh, if we can find the sea surface temperatures, we can find the heat content. And after 60 hours, this heat content really gets lost. And our relative humidity in this area begins to drop under 60, which is very unfavorable for tropical cyclones. And because of this, this is likely to kind of create uh, a pattern where, again, if we get a system to kind of generate too far north, we may end up losing a lot of this heat content and enter a more dry, stable air. We can take a look at this here on the 12Z GFS forecast, the A50 vorticity map. And what we'll notice is that we have a system right now that is kind of very loosely defined. It's very broad, and that's not going to be helping 95L in, in any circumstance. But we have a system that will be uh, down here and moving off towards kind of the west-northwest like that before bending back uh, towards the west later in the week. Now, we notice that in the short term, we maybe get a spin-up with this northern lobe of energy that tries to spin up here, comes northward, and ends up kind of spinning up. Now, uh, at this point, the system is still at about 10 degrees north, um, but that's where the unfavorable conditions ex uh, exist. And then once this starts getting past about 11 degrees uh, you know, getting closer to 12 degrees, the atmosphere becomes very unfavorable. And we can look at this here in the relative humidity that we have a system that has its own moist pocket further southward. But once you start getting north, you enter a more stable environment because of cooler sea surface temperatures. And you start to really get a lot of dry Saharan air uh, that is being entrained into the system. And we can kind of look at that here on a broader, a wide scale perspective that we have, again, shear is not really the problem, but we have a very strong capping inversion associated with the Saharan air layer. And we do have some dry, stable air that is kind of just above the surface, creating that capping inversion. And when you have a strong uh, cap like this, you can't really get thunderstorms to initiate. And because you can't get thunderstorms to initiate, this will end up kind of drawing out into an, an open wave at this point and not really generating into anything beyond that point. So this is the model run from the GFS. Whereas if we go back to, to the European run, this is the zero Z run of the Euro, much of the same and not even excited at all with that. And if we actually look here at the 12 Z run, uh, we can kind of see that again, nothing really ends up developing on the 12 Z run either. And this is kind of one of the, the factors of a wave that just gets carried too far northward into a more unfavorable environment with stronger upper level winds further towards the north, you just can't really create a background favorable environment. And this is still June. And the fact that we're seeing potential for development already in late June, this is a little bit of a sign and a window that we could be seeing like, okay, you know, something may end up kind of forming. But even if something doesn't end up forming out there, this gives us a clue towards later in the season what we could expect, especially having waves come off at lower latitudes. European ensembles, real quick, again, mostly uh, confined within the 72-hour time frame here, developing a closed trackable surface low at this point, and most of them kill it off here by day five as we start to just get too far north and more unfavorable conditions set up. So... Again, it's something to be monitoring. It's, it's very interesting that we do have a system this far east and south to be tracking at this time of the year, but certainly nothing to be concerned about if you live in the Lesser Antilles. Uh, and uh, again, we'll just be monitoring everything, but I'm not really deeply concerned about this at the moment. But again, we'll continue to track everything. We'll have updates on our Twitter. If you guys uh, want to follow my Twitter, links will be down in the description down below. 
And with that being said, hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Of course, I am Michael Romali. I'll talk to you guys again some more tomorrow.